Okay, so the first slide looks like this. So it's the color separations. And we're gonna talk about uh, reproducing color uh, for print jobs. So that could be screen printing, or it could be um, for print like Pop-Tart boxes, posters, flyers, uh, greeting cards, uh, anything that is produced um, in uh, multi-production, package designs, that kind of thing. Okay, here's your, your standards. They're the national competencies, the state standards, and you're graded on this PowerPoint. So make sure I am grading for accuracy. So if you need to correct your answers during the class today, then you can do that. So four points for each, which is gonna be a 140 point total formative grade. Um, and then your summative grades, you'll have a quiz tomorrow. And then you're gonna have an actual project where you're actually gonna to have to create a color separation, okay? So these are your essential questions. So if you'll take just a moment and read through uh, these essential questions. Uh, Tyler, if you don't mind being my volunteer and I'm gonna switch this camera over real quick while you're reviewing the um, essential questions. So Tyler, if you'll come on up. You're going to kind of stand right here and I'm, let me make sure they can see it. And then he's going to turn around and let y'all see it. Can you take over for me? Got it. Okay. So let me get back over here. So essentially what you're learning how to do is you're learning about RGB. You're learning about CMYK, the differences between those and spot. You're learning about color correction. Yeah, you're good. I can see right where you are. Um, you're learning how to um, apply concepts about registration and that kind of thing. So the first question I have um, is what is a color separation? So double check your answers. So you can see on the board that I have it broken down into the four colors, which is your cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Now, Tyler is holding an example of a Mountain Dew carton, like a drink carton for a 12 pack. And if you'll just turn around so the rumors can see, do y'all see what he's got? Liz, you paying attention? Okay, all right, all right, turn back around, okay. And you're good, okay. <laughs> I'll kind of just clue you in. And Zoomers, let me say this, if you can't see something, you know, like when I walk over, just unmute and yell, say, hey, Miss Baines, we can't see, and we'll adjust the position, okay? Um, so this is going to be your four color, what they refer to as process inks. Now, you can also have spot colors as well. Spot colors mean what? Who wants to kind of tell me real quick, what is a spot color? Uh, Zoomers, you guys can message in chat or you can answer. What's the main difference between a spot and a process? Alani, you want to give it a shot? Huh? Okay. Um, what a, let's see. Who do I want to call on? Um, Joseph, do you have an answer to that question? Madeline, Juliana. Okay, apparently y'all need to get some more work done. <laughs> you have the answer. Okay, what is the answer, Liz? A spot color is a solid color or any color generated by Okay. Okay, so really what, so the key word for what she just said is a single color and it's a single color and it's opaque. Okay, so make sure that you have those words. I'm gonna to flip to the next slide in a minute, which you'll have it. Okay, so what we're gonna do, Tyler, it, we're gonna peel these off later, like we're gonna peel them off and put them back on layer by layer. And he's gonna show you what these look like. I'm gonna help you. So you just hold it and I'm, yeah, and I'm gonna put them all on. So I'm gonna take them all off, hold that paper clip. Got it? The paper clips are functioning as registration. 
cutting that's what we're going to do so he's going to have two paper clips and those are going to be his registration i'm going to put it right here okay so these are going to be the registration and that hole is kind of big shoot that one okay so those are going to function as registration pins. They're kind of referred to as registration pins. Slowly turn around and let these people see. Uh, Raymer's, once he turns around, y'all look quick because he's going to be flipping back and forth. So the paper clips function as the registration pin. Okay. And then turn back around. So the first color that we're going to print, so if everybody will look, this is the yellow. Okay, so everybody look. I might just want to not type for a second, but just look. A yellow, and I know it's hard to see probably for the zoomers. You always print light to dark. You always print, always print light to dark. Let's just go back to this one. And what we're doing is registering the colors. You just hold it and I'll do it. That'll be easier. So just kind of hold it, hold it at the top. Just let me put it on. Just loosen your grip. Got it. Okay. Got it. And holding. Okay. Loosen your grip. And hold. Okay. Got it. All right. So, okay. So that's the yellow plate, which is the first one. So just slowly turn around for them. Yellow plate. Jalen got it. We're coming back this way. Okay. The next color is what? What color is this? Magenta. Yep, that's right. This is magenta, which looks kind of like a hot pink. Okay, so we're going to register this color. Let's see. And I don't have it yet. You just hold the yellow. Don't hold the pink. And then Left side. Okay, so I'm registering the magenta onto the jaw. Okay, all right, so that is your yellow and magenta. Let me just double check. Can zoomers or can y'all see that okay? We're not like too high. Yeah, I think you're good. Okay. All right. So now we're going to put on what color? What's next? Is the cyan, which is the blue. Okay, you will see the blue. So this is your cyan. Okay. And we're going to register the cyan. So you just hold that one. Okay, so now you can see that it's starting to look green because remember CMYK colors are transparent. So that means you can see through them. So as you layer the colors one on top of another, you have the illusion that you see more colors than what you're actually printing with. The last color is what color? Black, which is the K, which stands for, does anybody know? key very good which is the key ink which ties everything together okay hold we're putting the black on and you let go black hold okay and then we're uh, we're registering the colors so that they align because if the colors don't align the colors will shift which will you know, have like pieces that aren't together and it looks blurry. It'll look like kind of like garbage and it doesn't look very good. Okay, so that is the alignment of a four color process CMYK. Did I get so far? Now we have two more things to add. So what are we adding now? Okay, we are adding this plate, which has a solid color green, which is actually a Mountain Dew spot color. 
and you guys just told me what a spot color was, right, which is a single color. It is pre-mixed and it is opaque. This color is not transparent. So the spot, we've also never heard of it. Go with this side. So I'm aligning these colors. Okay, so now we're aligning the green spot. Okay, so now we have put on the green spot. Okay, the green spot. I'm going to turn around for them to see. So that's your opaque. Now, every company typically has a branded color, which would be referred to as a spot. So in this case, Mountain Dew has a green, Coke has a red, Pepsi has a blue. You know every color and that's where you get into because the next big unit that we're doing after the color separations and the color theory is we're moving into branding so that's where all of this is headed is because it goes in with company commercial packaging and all that so i found a lot of things what you know okay all right now what is the last thing that we're putting on this is a guy cut grid that has the outline of where the package should be trimmed and cut to then be folded and made into your like fridge pack that goes in your refrigerator with all the parts of your drinks. Okay. Okay. All right. So you can see that that has color bars and registration marks around the edge, which we're going to talk about again in just a minute. Um, but that's what it looks like as a consecutive whole, which so this would be a four color process plus a spot, which means you're printing five colors. You're printing CMYK plus your spot. Okay, so that would be four like cylinders with ink that you put on there for screen printing if you're printing different colors of your four different screens that kind of thing so i've got some videos i'm going to link the videos thank you tyler you did a great job you want to just slowly walk around and let them look at it um so i'm going to post video links so that you can actually see cylinders of ink and things that are going to be printed um with those examples okay just lay it down here and then sanitize your hands okay thank you y'all all have been alive to this y'all have been alive and she got a little portion yeah all right so all right moving on to the next piece so does everybody understand the process inks? Okay. All right. So kind of look over this real quick. This is what I just said about the CMYK process and spot colors. Make sure you have all that information correct. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a little, um, acronym that may help you remember because you're going to need to know the difference between subtractive and additive colors let me say that again subtractive and additive subtractive colors are cmyk additive or rgb now i always had a hard time remembering that so it took me a couple of years to kind of come up with something that could help me remember now, some of you remember Jack Sailors, probably. Um, he came up with an acronym for him. I could never remember his, he could never remember mine because you have to make it personal to you um, to kind of help you remember. So his was 
he remembered RGB as additive because he came up with an acronym that was like a video game kind of related acronym. So that worked for him. I'm gonna share mine with you. Okay, so this is the way I do mine. All right, then I'm gonna hold this up so that you can see this level two. And then I'm gonna bring it around for the rumors. Mine is Sally can make your keys. Okay, that's how I remember the subtractive is CMYK. Because my friend is named Sally, so it's relevant to me. Okay. And I just came up with random. Sometimes to me, the more random it is, the more I can remember it. Like even my passcodes and passwords, it's like it's it's like it has no relevance to me whatsoever, and I can remember it. So my acronym is Sally can make your keys. Okay, so you see this Sally can make your keys. Now that's how I remember. Okay, because what I do is see that's your S C M Y K. So that I can remember is subtractive is CMYK. See, subtractive CMYK. But Sally can make your keys. And then I know additive is the opposite of RGB. So I don't remember another one. So I know that's the opposite. Or Ali means grateful. Huh? For additive. Yeah, you, that's what I'm saying. You may can make up your own. Uh, yeah, for additive, you could do something that stands for the, that's what Jack did. He had the A. RGB one and came up with something that was related to him. So this will help you remember subtractive is your CMYK. All right, so that's my tip for the day. So if you guys wanna to try to come up with your own, you know, little acronym to help you remember, but you do need to know that subtractive is white light, um, which I mean, like it's gonna form for white and you need to know the opposite is RGB CMYK. Now, I do not have my diagram on here on the slide, but I am gonna check your diagrams, but we're gonna talk about all of this throughout um, the slides. And then on the next slide, um, I am not gonna ask you on a test about gamut range, but I want you to understand what it is. Gamut range can also be referred to as color space. You may hear the terms color space, so what that means is that different colors have different range of color options available. We can see with our eye more colors than we can ever reproduce in a different environment. RGB has a larger gamut range or a larger color space than CMYK. So what does that mean? That means that if I design this art and literary magazine, we'll use this as an example. So rumors, if you can see what I'm holding up, okay. If we design this on the computer, the digital copy would give you more colors than the printed copy. Have y'all ever noticed that when you have something on the computer and you print it and the colors don't look the same or the colors shift or change? The reason is because you're typically going from an RGB model to a CMYK model because most laser printers are CMYK. So you're gonna have less colors that can physically be printed um, on a CMYK physical production. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far? Okay, um, now RGB color space, RGB is what? Where do you typically see RGB? and computers, right? So typically RGB are gonna be tablets, phones, televisions, monitors, uh, projectors, all of that is RGB color space. Additive is the reflected light, which is RGB. So remember Sally can make your keys. So subtractive is CMYK. So we know the opposite of that is additive is RGB. Okay, because um, CMYK forms, I think I have, I don't know if I can get out of this without, I think if I try to, I was gonna share another file with you, but if I do that, I'm afraid it's gonna mess up the um, screen share. So I will show that to you kind of toward the end. It's got a little like a compare contrast for the RGB CMYK and Pantone. 
and I may post that file for you on CTLS. So you'll have a copy of that if you need to refer to it. Okay. All right, questions so far. All right, so Moray, have any of you heard of a Moray before? Um, have you seen one? Have any of you seen a Moray? Yeah, it's like a it's like a pattern and it's kind of a weird pattern. Now, again, this is a question I will not ask you about on a test. I will ask you about RGB. I will ask you on the test about CMYK. I will ask you about additive, subtractive, those things. I will not ask you about a moray. I just want you to know what it is. Yeah, but it's when you have a, like a half tone screen and it's a series of dots and it's when the angles aren't produced correctly and it gives you this weird overlap of, those, of the dot pattern because what you just saw on that, um, that Tyler was holding up, which is that, um, help me, Mountain Dew carton, that is all a series of tiny dots, which is how it gives you the illusion that you see more colors. So if those screen angles or the angles of the halftone dots were not produced correctly, then it would give you a more right pattern. So typically this is bad. Okay, they were, you know, this is not a desired effect. However, some students, if you're using it creatively, like that's your intention, then that's a different conversation. But typically you should not want or see a moray pattern, okay? All right, now I will ask you about Pantone on a test. Hopefully you guys know and understand what Pantones are at this point. A Pantone color, which is what you should have used, remember, for the t-shirt design project, it stands for Pantone Matching System, which is PMS for short. So typically they refer to the PMS 385, that would refer to your Pantone Matching System, color number 385. So it is a standardized system of color that's used within the printing industry. It's used around the world. And then remember, I showed you our Pantone book that we have. So I put an image here on the slide um, that is a color book that is based on all the major pigments. And it's kind of like a color by number, if you want to think of it that way. So it's a color by number, meaning that the number should match that specific color. Okay, so is everybody good on Pantone? Remember, they're opaque and they are spot. Correct? Remember Pantone equals spot. Okay, as a designer, it is super important for you to understand resolution. Uh, resolution is what can make or break the quality of the image, right? That's what resolution is, is the quality of the pixels or the dots um, and how they're related to the size of the image. Now, this applies to photography, screen printing, print production, digital design, web page design, all of this is important within all of those areas. Okay, so you should have heard of these things before because we discussed these in intro, right? Does everybody remember PPI, DPI, and LPI? So those are the three kind of measures of resolution. And do you see how next to each one, I put a measure of resolution there? And then you can see a measure of resolution here. So all of those are related to resolution. So what's the difference? PPI stands for pixels per inch, which is related to Photoshop and raster image. It's also related to photography. So anything that comes out of a digital camera is gonna be referred to as PPI. Now DPI stands for dots per inch and that's used for print production. So that's typically used with vector art. So again, when you're outputting from InDesign or Illustrator, um, it's gonna be related to the quality of the image uh, is gonna be dots per inch. Now LPI is related to screen printing. All right, so let me hold up the screen. So we're gonna talk about lines per inch. Now, when you look at a screen, okay, and uh, Zoomers, this is the screen, um, there is a number on the back of each screen. Now, those of you who printed your own personal designs last year may understand this more than the ones who did not. Do y'all see there's a, it's in that, uh, there's a line of that. This is a 110, it's a 110. So that determines the screen mesh or the line, uh, mesh determines the count of how many lines there are per screen. 
Okay, you see that number? Now, you have to use a certain LPI or screen mesh for a certain image based on the halftone dots and the color that you're printing. So all of that is related, okay? Now, this is not an exact science. That's why it's called art, okay? So that means that we have kind of guidelines, but sometimes you have to, it's kind of sometimes a guessing game, I guess is the way I can put it, based on the type of artwork, how thick the ink is, and the color shirt that you may be printing. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example. Is everybody ready? We're gonna say we're printing white ink on a black shirt, because that's typically the hardest to print. So if you're printing white ink, you need a screen mesh, meaning a line screen or an LPI that is large enough to allow the white ink, because it's thick, to pass through the holes in the screen. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Now, the screen mesh numbers, you don't have to remember this, but I'm just gonna tell you, we have 110, 156, 230, and 320. Those are kind of our standard screen mesh numbers. <laughs> so if I'm printing this image in white ink, I want a lower number screen. That means the lower the number, the larger the holes. The higher the number, the smaller the holes. Does everybody hear me say that? And again, that's something that we're gonna talk about again later. But I want bigger holes <coughs> to push that white ink through, the, through the, the screen. Now, why do I care really? Okay, because if I have 150 shirts that I need to get printed by tomorrow, <coughs> y'all understand that efficiency is critical, right? Because you've got to get it done. So I want to set my line mesh so that I can put, y'all know how we flash between colors? You know how sometimes like if you Hello. have the multi-colors? Multi hey, Moses. Um, that you're going to print the white ink um, with one coat. That's your goal, right? You don't want to print one coat of white, flash it, print a second coat of white, flash it, print a third coat of white, flash it, because is that going to take about three times as long? And you, you've got a deadline. So you want efficiency. Also, time is money. Your time is valuable. So again, you want to be able to get out as many jobs as you can so that you can get paid more money, right? That, that should be the goal. So, or you don't want to work as many hours. You know, it could be that the money's not as important, but you want more time off. So all this is affected by line screen. So what you need to understand, let me just kind of recap it again, is the higher the number on the screens, the smaller the holes, and you have to relate the artwork to the color of the ink that you're printing as to what screen mesh you need to print it on. So typically for white ink, you would print it on a 110 screen. Okay, is everybody good with that? And we'll talk about that in more detail later, but all of that is determined by resolution. Now, these are what I call the magic numbers. Okay, you do need to know this. Uh, level four students, y'all need to know this. You're gonna see questions about this multiple times on Adobe certifications, on any kind of certification exams. This is like, if you understand these things, it'll help you by process of elimination on other test questions. So know these numbers. So the minimum resolution, minimum resolution for print production. So that means anything that you're printing on an offset press or a digital press, or you know, like the lit mag, it's 300. And it could be 300 DPI or 300 PPI, depending on how you're producing it. The magic number for screen displays, meaning if you're putting a logo on a website, it's going to be 72. Okay, so again, 72 is for web, 300 is for print. So everybody got that? All right, now let me show you a couple of, of examples again. So this is your printing registration. So what does printing registration mean? That means that you are aligning your colors 
meaning the position of the colors. Okay, so when you have registration marks, and I put an example of what a registration mark looks like, um, it looks kind of like a target with a little white X in it. And they do not have to be round, they can be square. Okay. Okay, so let me show you, and we're going to look at different types of registration marks a little bit later. So hopefully you guys can see, I'm going to come back around with this, but do you see how these are square? Okay, so look at these. These are the registration marks that look like that. Our four bones do have some circles. Um, the ones that we use for screen printing, I always use circles. Um, and most companies use circles, but um, Tyler, can you come hold this again for me? Um, so most of the registration you will see are circles, right. but they don't, I'm just letting you know, they can be different shapes. Yeah, just hold this part right there. Um, and you'll see different ones on different, okay. Put your finger on that square registration mark, right? No, it's to the, the one on the right, kind of like right here. And then I want you to kind of zoom in, kind of get close to the camera and hold it still. Let me see if they can see. Go down a little and closer. Can y'all, Zoomers, can y'all see? Yeah, get down a little bit more. You're right there. Can you, Zoomers, can y'all give me a thumbs up if you can see that okay? Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, we're good now. Now stand back and I want you to hold it and you're going to kind of point around the edge. So as you can see, there are multiple registration marks that go around the edge of the art, like on the outside. And these are placed because the question says, where should they be placed? It should be outside of your image area. Okay. And just stand right there and we'll go back one step. Okay, so if you look right here, these go all the way around. You see how these registration marks go all the way around? They are outside of the printing area. So kind of like an look. Outside of the printing area. That means you can't put them too close to the artwork or they will print on the shirt or on the package where you don't want them to be. Okay. All right. And you can lay that back down. Thank you. And then if you look, this is my little Tony the Tiger. Isn't that the Frosted Flakes dude? Tony the Tiger. <laughs> um, so you can see, I'm gonna switch back over. Um, these, you will see registration marks. You see that one there? Start opening up your packages at home and you'll start seeing all these little color bars and registration marks that are on the inside flaps of all of your packages. Um, they are used for alignment and color checks. So you see how these little register, see these are all round. See the registration marks and those and then the color bars, which we're gonna talk about. So these are all on um, everything that you see printed, Jamie. You see the registration and the color bars. Okay, and those are gonna be on every package. Uh, that you will see. So go home and start opening like your pop tart boxes and your cereal boxes and it's even on like makeup and perfume containers and all that stuff. Okay, so do you understand that registration must be used if you're printing more than one color? Does everybody understand that? So anything over one color has to have registration. Y'all know what a registration mark looks like, is that correct? And then you know it should be on the outside edges of the page. Now, do you see this registration mark that I put on here? This is one that I made and it has a code. So again, if you're running your own business, you may want to have codes or brands with your products. So if you look right here, this stands for John McEachern High School GDP stands for graphic design production, which is level two. And then I usually code by number or I'll in some cases put the year. Okay, so that's a way for you to 
kind of make sure you know what's what. Okay, take a minute and copy this down because this is the one that you may not have been able to find and Google may not tell you the answers. So I'm gonna pause just one second. I want you guys to take a minute, get this information and then I'm gonna show you some examples of some shirts. can't hear me. <laughs> okay, you should see the classroom again. <clears throat> um, I'm going to, or Tyler's going to hold up some examples of some shirts for us to talk about the difference in commercial hairline and non-register. Yeah, let me show you what you put on the And then we're going to use your shirt. Just a second. Okay, but it's not for this section. Okay, the first example is commercial. <clears throat> so commercial registration means that there's a slight overlap of colors and it can be an overlap as small as 1 64th of an inch. Now the first example that Tyler's going to show you is a bad example and I kept that we did this intentionally so we'd have an example. So what you're pointing sorry is like to show them like where that orange overlaps the white. So kind of, uh huh, kind of get close to it, and yeah, kind of go up a little bit. So if you guys can see and just kind of hold it still and zip, go in a little closer, right there. Do you see how the orange overlaps the white? But it's actually too large, so that is too big of a trap. So one of the words that you heard in the uh, vocabulary was trapping. So say this to yourself, trapping is overlapping. Trapping is overlapping. Trapping is what? Overlapping. Okay, so it's where your colors overlap. Now on commercial printing, the trap should be small, like 1 64th to maybe a quarter of an inch, but it should not be that large. Okay, walk that around so they can see. Okay, now the next example, this is an example of uh hold on of trapping but it is a better example so we're going to look at the m do you want to hold this one up okay she's going to hold this one so did everybody see that so put that in front of the screen okay and come yeah right there's perfect okay so you see the m c and the e there's a blue outline but the gold is kind of underneath it but it's a commercial print because the blue is slightly overlapping the gold. And that is what we, is most common in printing is that commercial size or printing. Okay, so Zoomers, you can go ahead and walk that one around. Zoomers, y'all give me a thumbs up. Uh, Juliana, Joseph, I'm looking at who I'm talking to. Genesis Kennedy, David. Uh, 
uh, Soraya. Yep, y'all are all good. So y'all saw that example. Okay, <clears throat> now hairline is the hardest to print. It, you can just lay it back right there. It is um, like where the two colors, take your hands, Tyler, and do this in front of the camera. Do that, like, see, they butt up, perfect, right next to one another. Very good, okay. So this is an example of a tight registration where the colors have to physically align with no gap, but they don't necessarily overlap the other color. Now, we never, ever, ever print hairline because we just can't. We're not good enough to do it. I'll be honest. We don't have the equipment technology. We don't have the skill level. There's too much room or margin for error for students to do this. Uh, not many companies actually do hairline either because it's hard to do. Okay. So, all right. Good. Yeah. Like, yeah, if there's even a slight like movement, then the whole, like you'll have a gap and you'll see it and it looks bad. So you can walk that around. So <clears throat> it's a little bit harder to print. Um, so, and that's not even a full hairline. That's just the closest example I have, but it's really hard to see. Okay. Now this is an example of a non-register. Okay, so non-register, you can show them the whole shirt, the back, okay? Well, both the front and the back, that's the front, which is fine. Go back a little bit though, like go further away. Okay, yeah, can you guys see that? Yeah, that looks better. Okay, so do you see how the red is not touching the blue? Okay, and you can flip it to the other side. This is red at the top, black in the middle, blue at the bottom. So it's still a multicolor job. You can walk it and show it to them. Um, it still has to be aligned, meaning registered, so that the colors are in the correct position, but the colors do not physically touch. That's what non-register is. So even though it says non-register, it doesn't mean it's not in registration. It just means the colors are not physically touching one another. Okay. All right. Does everybody understand so far? Okay. All right, Jalen, did you see that one? Jalen, you saw the non-register example? Okay, make sure you know, make sure you know what non-register means. Now, you might also want to add, probably need to add this on mine, that sometimes you'll hear the term hairline and tight the same. Like you'll hear they'll say tight registration. That really means hairline. That means like it's super, super detailed. Now, this is a shirt that was printed and it was for competition one year. And this, the student messed it up. Um, of course, they fixed it after that one shirt. But that's what out of registration looks like. So that means, and come a little closer, that more. That's okay. the design of it. Yeah, now it looks kind of cool, but no, the design was actually the red was supposed to be in the outline. Do you see what I mean? Like there, there should have been yeah, not kind of that much of a white gap. Uh huh. So it's out of registration slightly. If you want to walk around it. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't look horrible, but that was not the that was not what the original art was. Small white should be a small white outline around the whole edge. Yeah. So that means it was misaligned. Okay. Now, all right. Thank you. I'll call you back in just a minute. <laughs> okay, y'all are doing great. Um, now, do you understand? so far the differences in the types of registration okay do you have any questions before i move on we're almost finished so we're doing good on time okay i'm going to use that awkward teacher wait time as there are no questions okay all right so this is trapping now we're not going to get super detailed into spread and chokes today. We're gonna to talk about that later, but I want you to see kind of what those are because I don't think I specifically ask you to have those words on your slide. Um, but what you need to remember is that trapping is the overlapping of the colors to make sure that there are no gaps within the printed color, okay? Now, Okay, I'm sorry, Tyler, I need you back again. All right, so, all right. So now we're talking knockout and overprint. 
<clears throat> okay, now get really close. Look at Tyler's shirt that he's wearing. You're gonna have to squat down a little bit because you're tall. Okay, the word passion, that black text is actually printed on top of the best I could tell by looking at it. It's physically printed over the flames, right? Isn't that what it looks like to you? So that's an overprint. Okay, so let the people in the room see it. So if you look closely, you can see that the flames were printed first and then that black text was printed on top of the other colors. So that's what they refer to as an overprint. Typically overprints are, we typically overprint black because it's the easiest color to overprint. Uh, there was a student in my first block class who had on the McEachern soccer sweatshirt and his was a full white design with the Vegas gold as an overprint on top of the white, like a little, like um, a frame or a rim to the design. So that was a good example. Now, a knockout, uh, we can, I can show them that one too. Uh, let me see if I have a knockout. So a knockout is essentially negative space. Okay, let's use that. Back so do you see how go just a little closer okay good do you see how there's a blue outline around the gold m there's a blue line between the white and the gold okay so let them see that that's essentially kind of like a knockout so you're using the color of the shirt to become part of the design by using negative space Okay, so let me say that one more time. So you're using, so think of like if you take your fist and you punch it through a wall. Hopefully y'all haven't done that, but some of you may. <laughs> if you get angry and you punch your fist through a wall, what, what are you doing when you do that? You're making a hole in the wall, right? So a knockout, that's why I'm using that analogy because it's like you're knocking out the space or you're knocking out a hole in the wall. It's, it's the same principle. It means that there is nothing there. There's no color, there's no artwork, there's no space. Um, overprint is the overlaying of one color on top of another. So does that make sense? So you can use knockouts. Uh, it's kind of like that positive negative space in your elements of design. Uh, you can use that creatively to give you the illusion that you're printing more colors. So that way you can take a two color job, but make it look like it's a three color. Okay, all right, now hard proof and soft proof. Did y'all have that on your slide? Yes, okay. So um, essentially what that means is that a hard proof would be a physical piece of paper that is printed to the laser printer or to a digital printer. Uh, that means that it is the camera ready and the proofing would happen on a sheet of paper that you can hold or touch or feel. Does everybody understand that? That's a hard proof. A soft proof would be digital. So that means a PDF. So when I say send me a PDF copy of your work, I am soft proofing your work. If I walk over to your computer and look behind you and I look at your screen and I say, hey, why don't you make this blue white and make this font this, I'm soft proofing. Proofing means checking your work for mistakes or errors. When you guys are uploading your designs right now, like your SkillsUSA designs to the Padlet, or you upload your thumbnails, then I'm soft proofing your work. Does that make sense? So soft proof is digital and a hard proof is a physical printed copy to paper. <clears throat> okay, do I have two thumbs up on that one, hard and soft proofs? Hopefully y'all can remember that. And uh, the last slide is discussing color bars. So color bars are used to make sure that the colors are accurate. Now, if you look at this example, these, uh, this little box here, this is what your files are going to look like when you generate them out for me to grade for these next few projects. <clears throat> so you're going to have what they call crop marks. 
um, which are the little, you know, things that are here. You're going to have registration marks. Um, and then you're going to have color bars. So all of these things together are called printer's marks. So when you, like in Illustrator and InDesign, when I ask you to generate out your files, which y'all are going to learn more about outputting <clears throat> PDFs, you're going to output with printer's marks, which will give you all of this information. It'll also typically give you the name of the file and the date in which the file was generated. Now, these are more color bars that look, these are just more examples. This also gives you a couple of different looks of registration marks here too, so you can see those. And then the color bars, this is what it might look, you know, on a PDF or the color bars that were on the actual package design. So let me go over and show you these again. <laughs> so these are the color bars on the cereal carton. So you can see those to make sure that the, that the blue is blue and it doesn't look like too purple or to make sure that the CMYK colors are correct. Um, I actually had a job. This was my job was they would call me up and I'd have to drive to wherever they pulled the, what they called the proof sheets. And I would have to go check and make sure that the color was correct um, on the jobs before they ran them. And if I had to sign off on them and if I did not sign off on them or if there were color issues, um, then they would have to adjust it on the machines before they would finish the print run. And it could be 30,000, it could be 400,000 copies of something, but you have to have those colors approved uh, from a proof, typically a hard proof um, in a viewing booth uh, for color. And then once they're approved, then they're printed, okay? Now, I uh, went through the whole thing, which is good because we wanted to finish on time today. So do you have any questions or is there anything I need to go back and clarify anything that I need to review before we kind of start wrapping everything up for the class? Okay, here's the file that I was gonna show you. Um, this has kind of a, let's see, man. This, ha this has like your compare and contrast. So this gives you your visual example. So you can see, so this is your CMYK subtractive, which basically the middle of that, it's always gonna combine for black. And then your additive is, all, is always gonna be reflected light because it's RGB. So remember the color of light is typically white, even though you know we don't get scientific because if you get scientific, people will say light is not actually white. It has color cast, you know, green, the sun has a yellow warm cast, but essentially <clears throat> just think of white light, just if that helps you remember that it's reflected light it's typically the color of the lights in the room are white. So RGB is going to be additive because it's going to be white. And then your Pantone matching system numbers, again, are gonna be those pre-mixed, like you call and order a bucket of number, you know, 287, which is McEachern blue, and you get a bucket of pre-mixed opaque blue. Okay, CMYK colors, subtractive, those are transparent, right? And then this is reflected light. And then Pantone is opaque, solid, and pre-mixed. Okay, and this kind of gives you your colors with your, similar to like what your primary colors would look like um, for your uh, diagrams. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead then, I'm gonna close this, I'm gonna stop this um, screen share real quick and I'm gonna stop the recording and then you guys have all of your information.